Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. It is once again to do a recent reads wrap up video where I wrap up the last five books that I've read in 2023. Today we are wrapping up books 21 through 25. <laughs> before I jump into the reads, I just wanted to make a very, very quick announcement. I have recently created a coffee page. This is really just an easy way for you to show support for me if you wanted to do so. You could buy me a coffee. I believe it's at like three or four dollars per coffee. And this is just something that I plan to use to maintain my channel. I'm sure that y'all are aware that there are costs associated with creating content, especially with the like the platform that I use to create my thumbnail and some other things. And so I just created that as a way for me to be able to more easily afford to continue to create content. I do work for higher education education in the state of Mississippi, which means I get paid practically nothing, but I just love this channel so much and I wanted to be able to maintain it. And so I thought that this would be a very, very easy way for you to do so. Again, there is no obligation whatsoever to do this. I just wanted to let you know in case you see it linked down below. Another thing that I have added to coffee is if there is a particular book that you are dying to see me read and you want an exclusive vlog dedicated to that book, you can commission me to read that book. And the prices differ depending on the length of the book, but basically you tell me a book that I absolutely have to read and then I create a vlog specifically based on my reading experience of that content. So those links are all down below. Again, absolutely no pressure. I just wanted to mention it here in case you see the link down below and are wondering what it is. That is what it is. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into my recent reads. So the first book that I have here is The Chalk Man by CJ Tudor. CJ Tudor is one of the authors that I wanted to definitely try in 2023 because she definitely has quite a few books out now and I've heard some amazing things about her, in particular The Chalk Man. And I kind of feel like I'm going to have a hard time describing what this book is about because I'm not necessarily sure sure I got what was advertised on the back. In some ways I did, in some ways I didn't. So when you read the dust jacket for this, it feels like it's going to be a very straightforward story. So you have present timeline and a past timeline. Both are surrounding Eddie. The past timeline is 1986. He is just a young boy of about 12 and he and his three friends one day discover a body in the woods. So he and his friends actually kind of have this code using chalk men where they will leave a specific chalk man out in front of their friends' homes, kind of lets them know when and where to be at any given moment. And one day chalk men that weren't drawn by any one of them leads them to a body in the woods and it kind of goes from there. And then in the present day, you're following Eddie. He is 42 years old. He hasn't really done much with his life. He's kind of a functioning alcoholic. He's still very much haunted by the events of the past. And one day he receives a letter with a chalk man in the mail. And so this book is kind of asking, did the person who killed that body in the woods 30 years ago really get justice or is he still out there? Because there was somebody fingered for the crime, but now it seems like that person has resurfaced in the present 30 years later. So it definitely sounds like a more straightforward story than what you got because in the past time, you are dealing with more than just Eddie and his friends discovery of that body. You are also discovering some separate things that are going on with Eddie's friends that all kind of tie in somehow. You are also dealing with the person who is thought to have murdered the girl in the woods. So there are a lot of moving parts that are going on in the past timeline. And I don't really want to say too much more about it because I don't want to give away any specifics or risk any spoilers. But then in the present day, you are following Eddie as he gets this chalk man and he realizes that his other friends, his friends from the past also got a chalk man. And he's trying to understand what it means. Is it a prank? what's going on and then one of those friends actually goes missing and he realizes that there is more to this and he is determined to find out what is going on who has sent these chalk men who was responsible for the body in the woods 30 years prior so again i went in thinking this was going to be a lot more straightforward than it was but there were a lot of moving pieces all of the little plots that are going on in the past get resolved in the present timeline and overall i thought that that was pretty intriguing that there was just no one thread that there were multiple things going on multiple different whys multiple different perpetrators if you will but i kind of got lost in all of that. And I also didn't feel um, an emotional connection to the story. So I found myself just kind of going through the motions with this book. While I was in it, it was a fairly okay reading experience, but I found myself zoning in and out. And I think that's another reason why a lot of the details just didn't stick with me is because it wasn't fully capturing my attention. And even now, a lot of the details of this book are lost to me. This book is going to be lost to time eventually. Like I'm not going to remember anything about this in the future. And this definitely wasn't the bang that I was expecting. This was very slow moving. I didn't even think it was all that character driven at all but yet it still moved very very slowly so if it's moving slowly and I'm not getting the character driven narrative that I want like the Ruth Ware book that I'm about to talk about in a minute if it's slow moving I'm not getting the character driven development that I'm looking for I'm not connecting to it I'm not emotionally invested in these characters I don't know what I'm getting out of this book and so unfortunately this really didn't leave a lasting impression with me I think I gave it a three stars I just had such high hopes for this one because I've heard such amazing things about it and this is like the one that I hear most consistently talked about from CJ Tudor and I'm just kind of nervous that if this one doesn't 
gonna hold up for me that none of her books will. So I actually kind of went on a string of reading British suspense thriller authors because next I have Watching You by Lisa Jewell. Y'all know that I discovered Lisa Jewell in 2022 and she has now become an auto buy suspense thriller author for me. I just love the way that she is able to weave tales. A lot of her books feature on multiple different timelines that she brings together so beautifully and this one was no different. So this is told from three separate perspectives but they all are kind of centered around one man, Tom Fitzwilliam. Tom Fitzwilliam is like the headmaster of a local private school. He is a very very respected man but he is the person that connects all three perspectives in here. So this is set in the neighborhood of Melville Heights. It's a very upper class well-respected neighborhood in Bristol, England and Tom Fitzwilliam lives there with his wife and his son and his son is one of the perspectives that we get in this story. His son is 15 years old and I, I don't want to say he's a voyeur because that's not the right word for this. He is just a very curious boy who likes to look out his window and kind of spy on everybody and see what is going on. So he has these binoculars and he's kind of keeping tabs on everybody. There's nothing really sinister about what he's doing. He's just kind of a nosy kid. He is actually a prodigy with aspirations of joining MI5. So he's kind of looking at this as practice for when he becomes a spy in the future. And he notices one of their new neighbors, Joey, and some suspicious interactions that he has with his father. And so that kind of brings us to Joey's perspective. So her brother, who is a doctor, and his wife live in the same neighborhood as Tom Fitzwilliam, like right down the street. And so Joey and her new husband have actually moved in with them. And then Joey first gets a glance of Tom Fitzwilliam, who is twice her age. She is like 27 and he is in his early 50s, but she is instantly infatuated with him. She becomes obsessed with him, not dangerously so, but it's more like the possibility of what could be. She's very, very attracted to him and things like that. And so this story kind of follows the progression of that obsession and her relationship that is developing with Tom Fitzwilliam, some of which of course is observed by Tom's son, Freddie. Now, as I mentioned, Tom is a very, very well-respected individual in this community, especially with what he's doing for the school. But another benefit of getting Freddie's perspective is that he knows what his dad is really like and he knows what it's like to live with his dad and his mom. So through his perspective, you're getting a different view of Tom Fitzwilliams, whereas the whole community at large seems to be very infatuated with Tom, of course, Joey as well. And then the third person that you're following is Jenna. Jenna is a teenager around Freddie's age and Jenna is not convinced that Tom Fitzwilliam is as squeaky clean as everybody else thinks he is. She thinks that there's something very creepy and off about him, especially because he's paying a little bit too much attention to her best friend. And then meanwhile, Jenna's mother, who definitely suffers from some mental illness, some definite paranoia, thinks that Tom Williams is stalking her or is having people stalk her and follow her. There's something weird going on there and Jenna just doesn't know what it is about Tom Fitzwilliam, but she is not convinced that he is a great guy like everybody else seems to be. And she and Freddie eventually kind of connect and try to piece together some mysterious things that they've discovered. Now, all of these viewpoints are important because at the very beginning of the story, somebody has been murdered. You don't know who and you don't know what has happened. That is all pieced together throughout the entirety of the story. But as I mentioned before, I think Lisa Jewell just does that beautifully. She's always able to take these different perspectives and put them together in a way that I'm not expecting. And this was absolutely no different. And of course, I don't want to say anything more about that because I don't want to risk spoilers. But needless to say, I thought this was well worth the read. It was very engaging. It was very page turning in the fact that I wanted to know what happened and I wanted to know how all of these people connected, how they all related to Tom Fitzwilliam. What is Tom Fitzwilliam's deal anyway? Is he as good of a guy as everybody thinks he is? Or is there really something more going on here? What is his personal life like? What is going on with Joey and her infatuation with Tom? What is going to come with that? There was just so many questions that I wanted to have answered. And this just did a great job of propelling the narrative forward. So this was another strong, solid book from Lisa Jewell. I'm happy to have read it. I'm happy to have it on my shelves. And I will absolutely be continuing with her in the future because she's just so strong and solid and consistent in my opinion. Another fairly consistent suspense thriller author that I enjoy but I know is very hit or miss for a lot of people is Ruth Ware. I read The It Girl immediately after reading Watching You. This is definitely Ruth Ware's take on dark academia and I personally feel like she did a pretty brilliant job at it although this book is definitely getting some mixed reviews probably even like more on the lower side I would say but I found myself quite engaged throughout the entirety of the story. So this again has a past and a present perspective both of which are surrounding Hannah. In the past she's just 18, 19 years old and she is going to Oxford. She's away from home for the first time and during this time she meets April who is her roommate and April is very very different from Hannah in that she's very outgoing, she's lively, she's vibrant, she can be a little bit vicious at times but she's just definitely full of life and spirit and one day they're all kind of celebrating April who just completed a play and Hannah is going up to her dormitory and she finds April brutally killed. Hannah ends up fingering John Neville for the crime. He is a porter there at Oxford and he is somebody that Hannah has had really creepy interactions with. He's just a very creepy dude, almost bordering on inappropriate in some ways. Hannah is scared of him. She does not feel comfortable with him. And so when he sees Neville coming down the stairs that lead to their dormitory, she is absolutely sure that he is the perpetrator. And in the present day, you're following Hannah. She is 
is now in her late 20s. She is going to have a baby with Will, who was in their friend group back in college and who actually dated April at the time. And she gets a call that John Neville has died in prison. And she has a lot of complicated feelings about this, but that is even more so when kind of an investigative journalist reaches out to her saying that he thinks that John Neville might have been innocent. And that kind of leads Hannah into a tailspin because she cannot handle the idea that she might have fingered the wrong person and she is determined to figure out what actually happened to April. So you're jumping back in time and then in the present day, figuring out what actually happened and during Hannah's investigation. Now, first, I will agree with a lot of reviewers' perspective on this book and that it is entirely too long. It is um, about 420 pages. It was like a 17 hour long audiobook. So definitely on the longer side for a suspense thriller. I feel like this could easily have been cut by 50 pages and would have had the same amount of gravitas, probably even more gravitas because there would have been a little bit less repetitiveness, a little bit less redundancy. So I definitely can agree with the sentiment that this is very long. But at the same time, I wasn't necessarily bothered about it because I find that Ruth Ware does a great job of doing fantastic character driven suspense thrillers. And at times I know that that seems antithetical because suspense thrillers, right? They're supposed to keep you on the edge of your seat. They're supposed to keep the pages turning. They're supposed to be moving fast, fast, fast. And a lot of people go into those stories with that expectation. And so they go into a Ruth Ware and they're very disappointed because that's not what they're getting. But I enjoy it. I enjoyed the slow burn character driven aspect of Ruth Ware's stories. You don't necessarily get the thrill and the suspense at all. But if you do, it's like a little bit later towards the book. The culmination of everything that you have learned is coming to a head in the last hour or two of the audiobook. So everything that you've been working for, that's when you get it. That's when you get the bam, the bang, the reveal. Ruth Ware's books definitely build slowly. She examines every detail and then she re-examines it. So they're very thorough in my opinion. And like I said, they can be a tad redundant, especially when they are this long. And that is a common criticism that I heard about this book. But that doesn't mean that the story wasn't well crafted. And it doesn't mean that this wasn't worth the read. You just have to get through a lot to possibly get to the part of the story that you are looking for. But me, I liked the journey of it. I liked following Hannah in the past and the present, getting to know all of the pertinent characters in the story. And I actually think Ruth Ware did a really good job with the twist. It wasn't really something that I was expecting. Yes, of course, when you're dealing with a limited cast of characters, you always have to consider that one of them is the perpetrator, of course, but it's always about how we get there and why we get there. And I think Ruth Ware did a really great job with that in this book. Now, there were some aspects of the story that I could have done without like Hannah's pregnancy. It's mentioned multiple times over and over again. And here, Hannah is having a baby. She loves the baby. She wants to protect the baby. She's worried about the baby. She's stressed. She's got high blood pressure. How is that going to affect the baby? The baby, the baby, the baby, like over and over and over. But it didn't actually add anything to the plot. Like, I don't know why she was pregnant in here at all. Overall, like that was something that I really didn't feel needed to be in there. And that right there, all of the mentions of the baby in her pregnancy probably could have cut down like 20 pages instantaneously. So that was a little bit much for me. But overall, I don't have very much complaints about this. I thought this was a solid attempt at Dark Academia. I overall had a very enjoyable reading experience and I gave this four stars. So I recommend. All right. And then I finally read Carrie Soto is Back by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This is supposed to be on my March TBR, but it actually came in a few days early from the library. So I read this at the tail end of February. Y'all know that Taylor Jenkins Reid is one of my favorite authors of all time. I am so constantly impressed with her ability to make characters three-dimensional that they just jump off the page and that they feel real. I got done with Daisy Jones and the Six and I felt like I could listen to one of their albums. I got done reading Evelyn Hugo and I felt like I could go watch one of her movies. She is just a master of character development in my opinion and Carrie Soto is no different but Carrie Soto is also a very unlikable character for a lot of the story and that might not actually be a surprise because if you've read Malibu Rising you know that Carrie Soto was featured briefly in there and though although brief her presence and her role in that story was not a positive one. She was actually the cause of quite a bit of drama and turmoil and so I was interested to see how Taylor Jenkins Reid translated that into Carrie Soto is back if you were going to be able to have a redeemable character in this story. So Carrie Soto is actually a professional tennis player. She has been training with her father Javier who was a very well-respected tennis coach. He has basically been training Carrie from the moment that she could be trained to be one of the best tennis players of all time and that is exactly what she became. She became one of the best tennis players the world has ever seen with a record of the most Grand Slams won ever out of both male and female tennis players and at the start of the story she is six years retired so she is in her late 30s and she is very confident and secure in her record until another tennis player Nikki Chan who is in her early 30s is set to beat Carrie Soto's record and Carrie is not having that. She is not going to have her record defeated after she worked so hard and killed herself for it. She wants to remain the best tennis player that has ever lived basically and so she comes out of retirement to if not win another Grand Slam but to prevent Nikki Chan from being able to do so and all she has to do is win one of the greats like Wimbledon and things like that and so this is a story about that journey. Now let's go ahead and get this out of the way because a lot of the complaints that you're probably going to hear about this story is that there is so much tennis and yes there is so much tennis. Tennis is almost a character in this 
Carrie's story, just like Carrie Soto is. With the exception of her father, tennis is the main relationship in Carrie's life. So just like music was a character in Daisy Jones and the Six, tennis is a character in here. It is her obsession. It is her passion. It is her legacy. And she's going to do everything she possibly can to defend that legacy. So yes, you dive deeply into the world of tennis here because there is a lot of talk of strategy and technique and you get gameplay on the page as she's writing different matches between Carrie and other people. However, even though I am a tennis fan and so I enjoy all the aspects of tennis, but I don't necessarily feel you have to like tennis or sports at all in order to be able to enjoy this story because just like any other Taylor Jenkins read, this isn't just about tennis. This is about Carrie as a character and her development over time. Like I said, is she a likable character a lot? No, because she is arrogant. She is cocky. She is 100% a sore loser. In fact, she doesn't know how to lose. Losing is not an option. Losing is not acceptable. Losing is a failure to her. And she is also not a humble winner. She doesn't shrink herself to satisfy anybody else. So she doesn't have the same grace with winning as a lot of people. She knows that she's the best. She knows that she deserved the win. If somebody was easy to beat, she's going to tell them that they were easy to beat. If somebody sucks at tennis, she's going to tell them that they suck at tennis. She is not a likable character. And sometimes she can be very, very frustrating because she is not willing to accept a loss, even though literally everybody loses at some point in their life. But there's a lot to be frustrated with about Carrie. But that's part of the journey of the story. And it's also part of her character development because you watch her as she's 37. She's set to be one of the oldest people in the world to go and win some of these matches. And you're seeing her struggle with her age and the limitations of her body. And you're seeing her struggle with some other things that are going on with her life as well. And it was just fantastic. I enjoyed this story from start to finish. I was absorbed. I was invested in Carrie. I rooted for Carrie. I wanted to see how she could do. I wanted to see how this was going to turn out. It was just a phenomenal reading experience. I actually tore through this a lot more quickly than I thought I would. I tore through it in probably less than two days just because it was so easy to sit there and read. So again, I just thought Taylor Jenkins Reid did a fantastic job of bringing Carrie Soto to life, making it easy to understand tennis and easy to see it on the page. There were just so many positive things about this story. And this story also humanizes Carrie as well because while she can be unlikable, you also see the heart in her, the passion in her, the determination in her. You see her capacity to love and her fear of getting hurt. So you definitely get the human side of Carrie Soto in this. And again, it was just fantastically done. I gave this a strong four stars. It didn't get higher for me just because there was a little bit of a lack of an emotional connection there. Like I didn't have the same emotional connection to it as I did with Daisy Jones and the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo. But overall, I actually do think that this was stronger than Malibu Rising in the end. So highly, highly recommend this one. Of course, as Taylor Jenkins read, I'm always going to recommend her. So this was a solid four stars. And then the final book that I have to talk to you about today, What Lies in the Woods by Kate Alice Marshall. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you what this story is about and briefly a little bit of my thoughts about this, but I am actually going to be doing a reading vlog that features this book. It is not a reading vlog that's going to go up anytime soon, but I'm going to save my more in-depth thoughts for this vlog. So stay tuned for that whenever it comes out. This story is following Naomi and her two friends. And when they were 11 years old, they went into the woods where they used to play. And on one particular day, only two of them came out. Naomi was brutally stabbed 17 times. Luckily, she survived her injuries. That doesn't necessarily mean there isn't some residual trauma from both her as well as her two friends who witnessed the attack. But all three of them fingered this one guy for the crime. And he was actually a guy that was under suspicion for multiple murders. And so they helped put a serial killer behind bars. And now in the present day timeline, they find out that he has died in prison. But there is now some question as to whether he was actually innocent of Naomi's attack, not necessarily of the other crimes he was being looked into for, but of Naomi's attack. So Olivia, one of the friends, actually calls Naomi home because she wants to meet with them. And she tells them that she is tired of lying and she can't do it anymore. And she wants to come clean with the police. But Naomi and Cass, the third friend, is not necessarily keen on this idea. There are a lot of complications that come from that, a lot of legal implications as well, like what could happen to them. But then one day, Olivia goes missing. Nobody knows where she went. And Naomi is very, very worried about her because Olivia is mentally unstable. She has been mentally unstable for a very, very long time. She has a mental illness. I don't know what exactly it is because it's not named on paper in here, but there are definitely some delusions that she suffers and things like that. Naomi and Olivia have been very, very close over the past 20 years. Naomi has always been there for Olivia when she is going through something. And so she is very, very, very worried. And something happens to Olivia and Naomi is determined to find out what actually happened in the woods 20 years ago, because she knows that there was something more than the story that they were telling the police. And she is determined to figure that out. Somebody does not want her to find those answers. And so you're following her in the present day as she's trying to uncover what actually happened in the woods 20 years ago. And in short, there were a couple of good twists in here. And overall, I thought that this was just a wonderful reading journey. Again, I'm going to be talking a little bit more in depth about this in the vlog that I plan on putting out. So more thoughts are to come, but this is another one that I highly, highly recommend. And I will absolutely be keeping my eye on Kay Alice Marshall in the future because I want to see what she can do with her adult novels because this was fantastic. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are the last five books that I have read so far. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these and what your thoughts are. Please also, I would very much like to know if you 
are enjoying this recent read series, I recently posted a poll on my community tab that asked whether you are liking these recent read series or whether you would prefer me to do an end of month wrap up going forward. I would love the feedback on that because if you don't feel like they are useful to you, if this is not the content that you want to see, I need to know that so that I'm creating more of the content that you want to see. So if you would prefer an end of month wrap up where I am taking all of the books that I read and wrapping them up in one video, let me know so that I can do that for you. Now that might be a very long video given how much I talk. I mean, it's already been 40 minutes of raw footage and I've only talked about five books. So, you know, there you go. But if that's what you want to see, please, please, please let me know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week, sometimes three, if I have my shit together and there's a third video to film. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.